take a timeout. Hi, I'm Brian Kenny, and welcome to ESPN Classic's Top 5 Reasons You Can't Blame, a series that takes a fresh look at sports personalities who are remembered largely for their mistakes, controversial moments, or questionable decisions. For much of the brisk winter day in Denver, it looked like the Cleveland Browns would be frozen out of a Super Bowl bid for the 22nd straight year. But after an 18-point deficit was closed to just seven in the fourth quarter, Browns running back Ernest Biner was heading toward the end zone. But when Biner fumbled just three yards short of glory, he instantly became one of Cleveland's most reviled sports goats. Not many people grow up in another city and move to Cleveland. Most people that are Cleveland Browns fans grow up in Cleveland and they pass away in Cleveland. Go on, the fans and the players back then, we, we were interchangeable, interwoven. They were part of us, we were part of them. The last champion is 1964. So Clevelanders were we were looking for something to cheer us and buoy us and make us proud of our cold, hard-working city. Stoking the Browns' Super Bowl expectations in the 1987 season was their near miss a year earlier. Leading the Broncos 20-13 with five and a half minutes left in the fourth quarter of the AFC title game, Cleveland's defense set itself on Denver's two before a stadium-shuttering 80,000 home fans. This Browns team is feeding off the emotion of this packed house. There's no way that the Denver Broncos was going to take and drive the length of the football field. In our stadium, in our backyard, nobody really thought we could do it. No one outside that huddle or on our sideline really thought that we had. My wife turned the TV off. This is just so not like me to, to quit believing, but I thought it was over. Despite Janet's lack of faith, her husband took his team to the Browns' five-yard line and with 42 seconds left, set himself to receive the snap. At the five, third, and one. You always worry about down there, but getting the ball tipped and having, you know, getting it intercepted. And so I never threw a ball as hard as I threw that one. Touchdown, Mark Jackson. It was just a, a hair above Carl Hassan's outstretched hand. It would, it deflected, the game would have been over. But it wasn't meant to be, but it was a horrifying experience. What if, you know, we could have got that hand on that ball? That's us in the Super Bowl. 5.48 into the overtime, the Browns' quest for their first Super Bowl appearance ended. It's on the way. And I remember after the uh, game, talking with Mike Johnson, you know, and the, the toughest part of it is the amount of work you have to do just to get back to that point again to be able to go further. But the Browns regrouped in 1987 to win a third straight AFC Central title. After beating Indianapolis in the divisional playoffs, they again faced the Broncos for the conference title, this time in Denver. The entire season, everything was geared towards the Broncos. And now it was time to perform. They had waited so long for the game that I think that they got very tight once they got into the game. Simon Fletcher with the sack at the four. Maybe we were too fired up in the first half. It was uncharacteristic of our offense uh, to dig such a hole. Over the middle, incomplete, intercepted. Oh. Going in at halftime, man, down 21-3, Nobody better than I. Nobody said much about what had happened. Just, you know, let's, uh, let's keep fighting. And then the throw downfield, intercepted. Felix Wright. In the first series, we got the interception. Scored a couple plays later. Going for Langhorn touchdown. Once we got a little momentum, then we were able to uh, get back on track. Those are looking for slaughter. They were coming back, and they were coming back strong, and everything they did seemed to work. The play-action pass game was working, the deep balls were working, and uh, they were getting big plays. We were up by 18 points, and boom. Next thing you know, uh-oh, man, we're fighting for a line. Ernest Biner, touchdown Cleveland. 28-23 the score. 
and they were rolling up and down the field, and it seems like we uh, were on, on skates trying to stop them. Underneath to Slaughter for a touchdown. It was our opportunity. It was the Cleveland Browns deflating the entire Denver fan base. With four minutes left in the fourth quarter, a John Elway touchdown pass to Sammy Winder put Denver ahead. Down 38 to 31, Bernie Kosar led a charge downfield as the clock ticked down. We knew we were going to score. We knew they couldn't stop us. Up the middle, Biner. They were moving the ball and moving the ball and moving the ball, and, and that's not the way it usually worked in Mile High Stadium. Kosar underneath the Brennan. I knew we were going to score. We were just moving the ball way too well. To the 24-yard line at the two-minute timeout. We had people sitting on their hands instead of clapping. So, uh, oh yeah, you could sense it. With 1-12 remaining, the Browns stood on the Broncos' eight. Kosar called a trap play designed for Ernest Biner. It was wide open. I mean, it, there was a huge hole for him there. And I saw Biner bounce through. I'm thinking score. Definitely thinking score. Uh, because I, I'm, I'm going to run over him. He was about to be saluted for putting a team on its back and getting rid of the memory of the drop by giving us the chance to tie the game. Ernest was so close to the to score until he, he, he kind of relaxed a little bit and didn't have the ball tucked away properly. I'm tucking the ball, getting ready to lower. I wish it was this high, but it was this high. It was over here, and that's a weakness. I'm probably 165, 170, he's 225. He's run over everybody on your team so far today, and uh, that's what came to my mind. And I said, hey, I'm going to try to knock this ball out of his hand. You're out of minor. I'm just, just thinking running. I'm just running. And, ooh. You know, ball's gone. Ernest Biner. Fumble. Fumble the ball, and Denver has recovered. Oh, my. The Broncos are celebrating, and, and Biner's just kneeling at the, at the goal line, and knowing that he should be in there with it, with the ball. Close. So close. Just so close on that last drive. So close. You come off a year before where you're emotionally just beaten down with the drive. You go through another great season, things are going your way, and this happens again. At the end of the fourth quarter, we had that one turnover that just, you know, kind of messed up the whole ball game for us. If it wasn't for that fumble, I'm sure they would have been going to the Super Bowl. Aaron's would be the first guy to tell you, hey, it's my job to carry the ball and protect the football. On that particular day, it didn't happen. The reality is it's my fault. You know, I'm supposed to take care of the ball. I don't care who's supposed to do whatever. It, the responsibility is mine. Careers are made and legacies are broken on one play. I mean, Ernest will always be a great player, but he gave it up at that one moment, and he, more than anybody, knew ball security was the key. I was representing everybody that was a Cleveland fan, all my players, my coaches that believed in me. And I let him down. Oh, what might have been had Ernest Biner held on to the ball. But every game is littered with what ifs. Before we begin our countdown of the top five reasons why you can't blame Biner, let's take a look at the best of the rest. Otto Graham. Beginning in 1946, the Hall of Fame quarterback led the Browns to 10 straight championship games winning four All-America Football Conference and three NFL titles. The real blame here lies with Otto Graham. Finally, the football guy said, hey, we're going to even this up here now. You know, you've been winning just a little. We're going to, you know, Ernest Bynes seems like a nice guy, but he's going to pay for all the sins of Otto Graham. He was called Automatic Otto, and he made things happen. The Browns won championship after championship. They were winners. They won all the time. And so you knew that there was something in your life was going to go right once a week. Unfortunately for Ernest Biner, he was the uh, balancing stone in that particular mm. situation in Cleveland. 
Another best of the rest is the 1987 NFL player strike. It caused the regular 16 game schedule to be reduced to 15. It turns out that the game with Denver is the game that is canceled. There was a week there where we would have been playing in Cleveland. If we played in Cleveland uh, and Cleveland would have beat us, then Cleveland would have had the home field advantage. At 10 and five, Cleveland finished a half game behind the 10, four and one Broncos. Forced to play away from their beloved dog pound, the Browns traveled to Mile High Stadium, where the Broncos had lost just one nine strike game in 1987. Back at the time at Mile High Stadium, I mean, the fans were just so close to the field where they would really, really uh, rash you, uh, beat up on you. I mean, tough, tough place to play. Here's reason number five, Webster Slaughter. The second year receiver failed to perform on the decisive play. What few people know is how the fumble occurred. The wide receiver's responsibility on the running play was either to block the defender, Jeremiah Castile, or if he was playing bump and run, run up into the corner of the end zone and take him with him. Marty is right. I mean, Webster didn't do what he was supposed to do. Well, our wide receiver took two steps and stopped and looked back to watch the play. His job was to clear out. And if he would have, Castile would have had to go with him, he wouldn't have even been there. I beat the receiver who was assigned to block me. I beat him to the inside. I'm certain that had Castile not been there, Ernest would have scored. There's a reason that they draw the plays up the, the way they do, and you know, 11 guys aren't doing what they're going to do. You know, it, it's not always going to work. We talk about why is this not Ernest's fault? If we'd have done what we was exactly was supposed to do and run the guy to the back of the end zone, then maybe he wouldn't have had a chance to react up like he did. Webster Slaughter and I play was Randy Moss before his time, just watching the play. One reason down, four to go. Here is reason number four. John Elway. Even if Biner had scored, the Broncos quarterback would have had a minute to respond with an answering drive. I think Lore has sort of developed that into thinking that was the winning touchdown. It would have been a tying touchdown. We still had to stop him again. Even as we were driving down to, to tie the game, you wondered whether it was going to be too much time left on the clock and number seven still was going to get a chance to go back out there and do that hero thing. In only his fifth year, Elway had pulled off 15 of his NFL record 47 comebacks in the fourth quarter or overtime including the one that crushed Cleveland's bid to make the Super Bowl a year earlier. Every time, it just seemed like Elway had an answer for us. I mean, when we hit a big play, they would come on and do something to hit a big play. Wide open, Natio to the one-yard line. John and Elway was a beast against us. I mean, we just couldn't seem, couldn't seem to stop him. Elway looking for a bundle, gets away. Those eyes in the back of his helmet. There was nothing out there that gave you evidence that the Browns defense was going to be able to shut him down either. Looking for Sewell, instead goes to Mark Jackson, and he has a first down at the 42, as Denver's Elway trying to answer Cleveland's Kozar. 65 seconds for Elway is about 60 seconds too much, so I, I, I did not think the Browns were gonna win that game. They couldn't stop Elway. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't get to him. They, it would have been the same thing as the year before. Coming up next on the top five reasons you can't blame Ernest Finer for the Browns losing the 1987 AFC Championship game. To see us turning the ball over, it was so unlike a Marty Schottenheimer Cleveland Browns team. Reasons you can't blame Ernest Finer for the Browns losing the 1987 AFC Championship game. Here's reason number three, other turnovers. Despite having committed the fewest turnovers in the league over the past two seasons, the Browns gave it up three times in the first half. Marty Schottenhammer basically said the only way we could lose this football game was by turning the football over. Over the middle, incomplete, intercepted! Oh. When you give a good offense like that, you're only 20 to 30 yards to score, it makes it tough on your defense. He throws wide open, touchdown! We were always, always focused on trying to get the turnover. And we live by the turnover, too. Fumbles. What a 
Broncos have their second turnover midway through this first quarter. If we don't get one of those turnovers, we don't get the fumble, and we don't get the interception, uh, we don't win. <laughs> we lost the football game in the first quarter. Those two turnovers was huge. After two turnovers and two possessions, the Browns trailed 14 to nothing. But they weren't done coughing it up. Will he down? I don't think so. I think they're going to call a fumble, yes. It was unbelievable that we could not get anything done the first half in that ball game. For us to, uh, to come out and turn the ball over like we did uh, in that half was very uncharacteristic. Not that Ernest didn't get it done, we didn't get it done. Have we begun to change your mind yet? If not, take a look at reason number two. Dog defense. After giving up an average of 16 points a game, second best in the NFL, the Browns defense played like puppies. The defense lost the game when you, when you get right down to it. They're not gonna win too many games giving up 38 points. People don't remember the ball being stripped going across the goal line. They don't remember us giving up 20 some points in the first half. They were so focused in, all of them, 11 of them on defense, focused in on number seven, that they forgot to play some of the other people. Team Lang! To the 10 yard line! You get a lot of guys saying, you know what, I'll make up for it. You know, I'll go make that play. And so you start seeing guys not being in position. Reverse Sewell, no one there for Cleveland. We wasn't containing him, we were getting up field, and again, not the way the defense uh, is designed to be played. Down 21-3 at halftime, the Browns scored on their first possession in the third quarter to close to 21-10. We thought things were going to turn around for us, and then uh, Elway comes down and hits Mark Jackson, maybe 10 or 15-yard rock. We had him in the pocket, we didn't make the play. Completes to Jackson. Who gets a first down and more. We had him short of the first down. We missed the tackle. I thought I was a pretty sure tackle, and I remember missing it. He may go all the way. Touchdown. So that's a smack right back in the mouth. We didn't play the way we were capable of play, playing, and we definitely didn't tackle the way we were capable of tackling. Touchdown. I know me and Hanford, we felt just as responsible for losing that football game as anybody else. I know I missed a few tackles in that game. I can't blame Ernest for that loss, and I never did because I knew that if we had done our job in the first half, you know, the game would have been that close. Ernest Biner. After leading the Browns in touchdowns and yards from scrimmage, he was true to form in the 38-33 loss to Denver, accounting for a game-high 187 yards. Without Ernest Biner, we're not competitive in that Denver game. He was the heart and soul of that team. Ernest Bynum was the most productive player on the field that day. He was running the football, he was catching the football. We couldn't stop him. Up the middle, Bynum! If you thought you were gonna get a great shot on him, he had the ability to make you miss. And when it was time, he had the strength to run through you and, and break tackles. Bynum, good second effort. The only reason why we got back in that football game was because of the heroics of Ernest Biner. Not only did Biner lead the Browns in receiving and rushing, he gained 138 yards in the second half. The adjustment by the money man, Biner. I thought he was exceptional uh, going against the linebackers. Down the middle, Biner's open. Ernest Biner with Lily to beat. I remember there was one particular play where uh, we lost contain on Bernie, and Ernest snuck out behind me and got about a 30-yard pass. Ernest Biner, touchdown! They had a 21-point third quarter, and Biner scored one touchdown on the pass reception. He also ran for a second touchdown. Touchdown, Cleveland! To tell you the truth, it was the best game I ever played. I mean, I, could, I was so quick, so uh, making people miss. It's one of those flow moments, or moments where things just almost happen in slow motion. I always think of that game uh, not about the loss, not about Denver or Elway, but frankly about Ernest Biner, whose performance that day was absolutely 
astonishing. I'm sure everybody in Cleveland and every Browns fan around the world was saying, holy cow, look at that little tough running back carry us. I mean, he was the hero. To put the, the burden of one game on one play, when a guy does so much to get them back in a position where they have that opportunity to uh, close the deal, you know, that's one of the most unjust things in the world. Well, there you have it, the top five reasons you can't blame Ernest Biner for the Browns losing the 1987 AFC Championship game. For Cleveland fans, it may take a Super Bowl victory to ease the pain. But we hope we have at least erased some of the blame on Ernest Biner. I'm Brian Kenny. Thanks for joining us. He's a father, father figure to me. I mean, I love, I love those guys, man. It, it was real. It's real, man. Cause, uh, If it wasn't, if it wasn't for the, the type of support that I got from a lot of those guys, I don't know. I don't know. I probably could have made it.